Good morning, everyone, and my apologies right to begin with. Ford makes me feel very guilty about what I'm going to say from this point on. So I'd like to apologize for three things. The first is I'm going to ask more questions than I'm going to answer, but that's what you get from an academic. The second is I'm going to put up a lot of information out there, not all of which I'm going to talk about, because my students, who are true natives of the world we live in, absorb information far faster than at least I can, and I challenge far faster than most of you can. And the third is I'm going to be provocative. And I'm probably going to say a few things that people might not like. So with those apologies, uh, let me start. We were talking about global education, and I chose to talk about it as technological innovation and whether that would be right for the 21st century. Let me put an alternative title out there. Have we across the board really progressed beyond the blackboard? We've done a lot of different things, but I think we really have to be very clear with ourselves. What is education, and how is it really defined as being different from the access and acquisition of knowledge? So let's take you back a while. And let's try to define what a university is. I'm not going to go over the definition. You all can take a look at it. John Henry Cardinal Newman, who a lot of us in academia really rever as a person who built up universities, talked about it as being this great thing, as being something that was aspirational, as being the center for knowledge. And yet R.M. Hutchins, a little bit later, as the president of the University of Chicago, changed the definition a little better, asked a question. And I'm going to ask you all, which question is really true? Remember, what we're trying to talk about is knowledge. Not just instruction, but how we get knowledge into our students. So let's take that a little further and talk about progress that we appear to have made. And let's start off with uh, Plato's Academy. We had students who sat at the feet of learned people, and they received knowledge. We changed that because we wanted to have democracy and make sure that knowledge got across to a lot of people. And so we went from a few people sitting around the learned professor who sat on a log or a chair with them all at his feet or her feet to a classroom. And we said, gee, that's not enough. Let's change the lecture room to one that has multimedia in there. And then we said, gee, that's not enough. Let's go ahead and co-locate people and distribute people so we could have people represented by screens. In fact, I'm disappointed that all of us are here today. We should be if we truly had technology at different locations talking to each other. And then we can go one step further which is what most of us complain about, that people talk to each other either by texting or through Skype or something else. But if you really look at it, how far have we come from 1862? When we were really supposed to take land-grant universities and take it one step further, get knowledge at that point in time in the agricultural and mechanical sciences, and then through all the other acts that we had, in terms of extension centers. One could consider today that an extension center is us using the internet and reaching out to someone. So if you go back and you look one step further and you ask yourself the question, have we really changed the way we access and acquire knowledge? My answer at least is no. We haven't changed significantly. We're using technology to make it easier, but we can do so much more. We are in a classroom in front of a screen. We could be at home or somewhere else in front of a screen. Is that a major change? My answer is going to be no. We had textbooks that took the best knowledge written by the best person so that the other faculty at other locations could use that knowledge. Today we have MOOCs. We might argue about them, but I'm going to argue that a MOOC is no different from a textbook. You bring it into your classroom or you bring a part of that MOOC into your classroom, 
and it's virtually a chapter in a book that you're going to try to use. We're all used to tests and exams, and maybe we've gone a little bit further when we do something online. We have individualized questions that check the progress of the student. But it's checking the progress of the student as per the learning style that I decreed was the important one, not necessarily the one that the student who's taking that class will actually be able to use. Just to talk about where I'm headed. 1855, when someone first saw the blackboard, wow! Well, we're doing the same thing today, except we're saying, it's a screen, another screen, something that I can do with a snippet, or the Khan Academy, or something else. They're all great. But have we really changed the way we do things? We're using technology. We're using it to make it better. We're using it to make it available to more people, but in the way that we give out knowledge, acquire knowledge, and talk about knowledge. I don't think we've made that much of a change. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Have we really progressed? The world has been transformed significantly over the last 25 years. 20 years ago, if you told me I'd be carrying a smartphone, and my entire life would be on this smartphone, that I could talk to my office, that I could actually lecture off the smartphone, that I could do all my banking on the smartphone, that I could buy things without ever going to a store, you'd probably tell me that would never happen. In fact, when they first started with Amazon, that was the question everyone asked. What do you mean I won't go to a store, I won't see something, I won't feel it? Well, look at it today. Now, that was a tremendous change. Let's take that change and compare it to the change in education. Education has stayed relatively constant through all these years. We've had changes in modalities of delivery, but essentially not in the modality of learning. We've started doing that, but it hasn't got there as far. So let me throw up a slide that just shows where the conflict lies. I'm not going to go through it. For those of you who would like to, I'd highly recommend that you read this book. It's a tremendous book that talks about the generation on a tightrope. It is very, very surprising to see the difference between this generation with data and statistics and the generations that all of us represent. The students of today acquire knowledge far faster than we do, and we actually complain about it. How can a student sit in front of a video screen, playing a computer game, talking to someone on the phone, eating, and reading something and saying, Mom, I'm doing my homework? Just not possible, right? Some of them are actually acquiring knowledge far faster than we believe that it is possible. In fact, when I taught a couple of classes a few years ago at the University of California, San Diego, a number of my students used to record my classes. And I asked them why. And it wasn't because they wanted to review it. It's because I was boring because I spoke too slowly. I didn't give them bursts of information very quickly. And that made it boring. That meant my style was not the style in which they were acquiring information. If you look at the video games that all our students play and look at the amount of information that they are acquiring and reacting to all the time, we all complain about those video games, but if you just think of the acquisition and the reaction to it very, very quickly, they're doing it far faster. Now, if we were able to use that modality to get to those parts of the brain, we might be able to have knowledge rather than information acquired by our students much, much faster. So the questions I'm going to ask are, are we ready to teach this generation? Is the concept of a physical classroom outdated? And I'm sorry, is the concept of a museum as we know it outdated as well? Should a classroom, a university, a museum, a school, should those all be a continuum somewhere where digital natives can just pick what they want and move on, 
rather than have to go through something that is very structured because that's the way we have had it. What learning environments do they need for full engagement? And what aspects of knowledge do we need in a competitive economy so that it's not just the basic knowledge we give them, but knowledge at every stage of their careers? This is not professional education. It's not lifelong learning. It's, I want information today. What do I do? I go to Google, and I find it. I go to Wikipedia, and I learn it. Now, how about if all of us put that information that we had on the web or on some structure such that when a person wanted that information, they could grab it. So when Milton wanted information about my talk, he wouldn't have to be here. He could just grab it and learn about what I do. That type of information is something that I believe we need to go to. We have to think about things in terms of not just these critical aspects, but aspects such as changes in paradigm. If you look at our students today, very few of them as a percentage go directly from high school to a four-year university. They go back and forth. It's not just around a long path. It's back and forth between different paths. They also do things like taking things online, co-located versus distributed education. One thing that is fascinating is a formal lecture versus organized chaos. And a lot of us do that, which is we actually try to have students take part in our classrooms. I challenge a lot of you in this room, if you ever sit in front of your students, let them hook onto the web. And instead of asking them questions, let them ask you questions and put what they're finding on the web up on the board while you're lecturing. They actually get a lot more information a lot faster. The point is, I'm scared when I do that because I'm being proven wrong all the time. Because every time I say something, I'm out of date because they've grabbed what's later. Every time I say this is the way it is, they found something to say, but it could be some other way. That's learning. And we have the way to make it possible. We have to think a little bit more in terms of rate and time of learning, which is what we're doing now by putting things online, versus the modalities in which people learn and the way in which we teach, and the extent to which people can grab that information, and how quickly they want to move on. I know I'm putting myself off of, completely out of a job. Strict <laughs> curricula. We love that at universities. But if you look at our students today, and you look at what they need to know, it's not just that strict curriculum, it's packages of information from all over the place. We have the technology to make that possible. We don't have the structure that allows that to happen. And that's where the administrative structure comes in. We are stuck with an administrative structure versus a knowledge ecosystem. If we had all our museums, all our knowledge centers, all our universities linked together such that we could grab this information, we and our students, think about how much more we could do Based on these paradigm shifts, we should do a lot of different things. I'm not going to go through them, but I'm going to posit that we should do it on a global scale. Not just talk about things between one museum and a university, but between museums and universities, between learning centers and all the rest. Globally, think about what could happen if at one point in time for a single class, students could get taught by the best minds wherever they were across the globe. It's possible. We just don't have the administrative structure to do it. Let's talk about re-envisioning the world and how we would take the undergraduate curriculum, or for that matter, the graduate curriculum. Let's take advantage of that freedom that we have of co-location. Geographical co-location is no longer a necessity. And let's try to enable the modalities, the extent, and the scope of learning rather than what we've always done, which is time, location, and rate, which is something we've definitely done a lot of. So I'm going to leave you with a few last thoughts. This is a discussion that's gone on for years and years, centuries, in fact. Teaching versus learning. It's an age-old debate. 
But I believe it has more relevance today because of technology. Because things have gone to a global scale, we have new modes for the delivery of instruction. Learning is actually possible for a wide range of people now by doing. And that's exactly what you're doing with the eyeball. They do it even though they're not in front of it. They are part of it. Think of the video games where we actually put ourselves into an environment. Now let's consider about doing that in class, where we put our students into the environment. So think of a nuclear reactor and students getting a degree in nuclear engineering. The very few nuclear reactors around that students can actually learn on, and even when they did, they did not have a critical event because that entire city would have had to be evacuated. But online, with a simulation, not just a simulation of numbers, but where you walk into it using augmented reality, you can be part of that. Can technology change that debate between access and excellence? We've always thought of our university as being one of two things, elitist, where only the top students get in, or open to everybody. Well, we have technology to solve that now. It's no longer the classroom that's limited by those walls. So can we actually solve that problem? We've always talked about education being the great equalizer. Can technology now be that great equalizer for education? Making sure that we bring the best instructors to all, making sure that all students have that access, and enabling that true continuum that we've talked about. So I'm going to ask you all to imagine the future, not the present, not the past. Let's imagine a future where technology allows for greater individualized attention. And that's not attention by saying, the person got a wrong answer, so let's give them a little bit more. It's looking at how that individual thinks and adapting to what that person does. Technology and global partnerships, not just a partnership between this museum and the University of Texas at Arlington, but any other university in any museum across the world. Can we have those collections of knowledge, almost like a menu that people can pick out and say, that's what I want to study? Keep in mind, our students today are not just those who come for a first degree. They're students who are trying to get ready for another career. The students because the world has changed and they have to grab that new information. Can technology blur the differences based on ability rather than age? We've always found it difficult for the very young or the very old. Well, can technology go right across that based on competency rather than time and seat? And finally, can technology make it possible for us to gain not just certificates and degrees, but packages of information where we need it, when we need it, and as we need it. I believe that is the future, and I'll leave you with that thought. If we can use technology to do that, then we will have succeeded. Thank you. <laughs>